Well, welcome everyone to our first of two water science poster sessions for this virtual conference. Um, my name is Jenna Dotson and I'm going to be your host this afternoon. I'm an adopt a stream state coordinator and I'm really excited that you guys are all here. So just before we get started, a few Zoom housekeeping notes. A reminder that the session is being recorded so we can post it to our website afterwards. You're going to be remain muted with your video off for the duration of this webinar, but if you need to um, get in touch with us for any reason, you can use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen and we can send your message and see what uh, is going on. And then also, if you have any questions during the presentation, please, presentations, um, please type them into the Q&A and then we will have one kind of Q&A um, session after each of the presentations. Um, yes. Yeah. So, hello everybody. My name is Jackie and I am the one of the program assistants for Adopt-A-Stream. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with us, we are a citizen science program that trains volunteers to monitor the water quality of Georgia's different waterways. Confluence is our annual uh, volunteer conference, and this year we are holding it virtually for the first time. So thank you for your patience um, and your flexibility as you know we bear through um, you know some technical difficulties if we if we hit those. Um, but we are so thankful and excited to have you join us today. Yeah. Um, so just to give a little outline of how this session is going to go, it's a bit different from the ones that have been going on for the previous two weeks, if you've attended any of those. So today we're going to have three presenters, and we'll be hearing about their awesome research projects that range from macroinvertebrate diversity, volunteerism and water quality, to swamp water chemistry. And today's format is kind of set up in research speed rounds, if you will. So each presentation is going to be about five to seven minutes long, with about five to ten minutes for questions afterwards. So um, be prepared with lots of questions. Um, that's always one of the most fun things when you attend a poster session and we're trying to um, create that kind of environment as much as possible in this virtual space that we're sharing right now. Um, and also these presentations are going to be a mix of pre-recorded and live. Um, but again, after all of the presentations, independent of what kind of presentation it is, the speaker is on the call ready for those questions that you will be firing at them. Um, so without further ado, our first presenter is Luke Morneau. Um, he is a volunteer with Upper Oconee Watershed Network and Oconee Waters. He is certified in chemical and macroinvertebrate monitoring and has been for several years. He just turned his video on, so you should see him now. <laughs> um, and today uh, he has a pre-recorded presentation where he'll be telling us the results of a project where he analyzed macroinvertebrate diversity in the Upper Oconee Watershed. And this project was overseen by Philip Bumpers, who is a research coordinator at UGA River Basin. So, Jackie will be- anyway, I'll note that I'm not Luke, I'm Ken. I also worked on the project with Philip and Luke, that oh. Luke could make it. That's gonna be obvious once the video starts because we don't look oh. the same. Okay, well, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. So this is no, good. No. <laughs> don't wanna have any confusion once the video started. Okay, awesome. The Upper Oconee Watershed Network, also known as UOWN, is a local group based in the Athens area that is dedicated to protecting water resources and improving stream health in the Upper Oconee River watershed through community-based advocacy, monitoring, education, and recreation. UOWN has collected over 20 years of water quality data. The group performs physical, chemical, and biological monitoring on a quarterly basis. It uses the Georgia adopt stream protocols for the biological or the macroinvertebrate monitoring. At each UN quarterly monitoring, some number of sites are selected for biological monitoring. The presence and relative abundance of taxa are recorded on Georgia adopt stream macroinvertebrate monitoring forms and the water quality index score is added to the UN data set. For this project, macroinvertebrate forms for the 2001 to 2016 were reviewed and the presence of macroinvertebrates taxa were entered into a separate data set. For instance, if stoneflies, mayflies, crayfish, midge, and worms were found at a site, this would be entered for the sampling date. 
This data set was used to understand temporal and spatial trends in macroinvertebrate taxa between the years 2001 to 2016. The data from 2001 to 2016 were from 404 samples taken across 16 creeks and tributaries. Some minor modifications to the data set were required to account for the changes in the adopted stream data set made in 2006. These changes were, were related to how macroinvertebrate taxa were assigned to sensitive, somewhat sensitive, and tolerant categories. For instance, the helgramite was moved from the sensitive to the somewhat sensitive category. The fish fly had its own category, but it was moved to Dobson fly slash helgramite slash fish fly. The caddis fly was separated into caddis fly and common net spinning caddis fly. The impact of this was noted in the analysis. Snipe flies were added into the sensitive category. Damsel flies and dragon flies were initially counted separately, but were grouped together. Beetle larva, Aetherix and Aether fly were listed as somewhat sensitive species, but were dropped. These were not considered in the analysis as few were found. The data was placed in commerce separated format and was analyzed using the Python programming language. Only seven creeks were only seven creeks were selected for an analysis as only those have been sampled at least twice a year. In addition to computing a mean water quality index, a mean species rich richness was also computed. Species richness was derived by counting the number of species on each sampling date. For each of the seven creeks, the percentage of sampling dates that have a given macroinvertebrate taxa was found and was computed. These results are provided in the table in the poster. They highlight the differences between the creeks with poor, fair, and good water quality. This indicates and also provides a look at the spatial differences in the Upper Oconee watershed. A temporal analysis was also performed to look at changes in percentages of different taxa over the years of 2001 to 2005 and the years 2006 to 2010, as well as the years 2010 to 2016. This was done in order to look for trends in macroinvertebrate presence. Changes in land use and stream habitat could impact species composition and number. Thank you. Awesome. Well, that was a great presentation from Luke. Maybe uh, we could, uh, Jackie, could we pull up his poster so we can kind of see those trends that he was describing? Yes, I'm pulling it up right now. And Ken, um, can you tell us how you were, you said you were involved in this project with him? Um, only on the periphery, really. Um, most of the work was done by Luke and Philip, um, but I did help review it with Luke um, because uh, Philip is quite busy sometimes, so sometimes it's good just to have someone there to uh, make sure you're doing the right thing, and then he would confirm with Philip later. Okay, wonderful. Maybe we can zoom in a bit, probably on the graphs that he was describing. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Yeah, on the, uh, what is my right hand side, the table and the graphs. Mm -hmm. Trying to see if I can do that here on the full, full screen mode. But what I can do. Oh, yeah, now we can read those there words. There we go. <laughs> All right. Should I zoom in one more or can everyone? Maybe a little bit more. Yeah. I think this is, yeah. Let's see. That's good. Okay. Um, sorry, Kim, I, would it be possible for you to kind of summarize? <laughs> I don't know if you're, how familiar you are with the results, but it was difficult to kind of visualize what Luke was saying without a visual. 
<laughs> yeah, po posters are tough when you don't have the poster in front of you to yeah. describe what you're talking about. Uh, this is the temporal data. So he broke it up into five-year periods to see um, if there were changes across the watershed, the upper county watershed um, in certain taxa. And uh, this is just a subset of in the taxa that are, of course, um, on the sheet, on the DACA stream sheet. Um, but these were the ones that seem to show the most change over those periods. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, taking the Sunfly, for instance, um, that one seemed to increase over the period of um, 2001, 2006, 2016. Um, SCUD, uh, I think this goes for everybody that, that samples in this area. We're definitely finding less of them. Um, I go out and sample as well, and I haven't seen a SCUD in quite a while, for instance. So. We used to find about 9% of the time we'd have scud. Now we're down to 2%. It's pretty rare. Um, so that gives you an idea of that. Um, any questions on these particular graphs? Yeah, um, I don't know. Does our audience have any questions based on some of the trends that you see in these graphs or anything that Luke kind of mentioned during his presentation? And if you do, please type it into the, into the chat. I'm kind of interested in, are these changes, for example, the stonefly, it was 43.9% and then went up to, I think that's 52.1%. So is that kind of change typical and you would, you would expect to see those kinds of fluctuations in these five-year periods or would that be a reason to think that something has changed in the system? Um, I think that those are open questions for further work. Um, clearly, there have been changes in land use around the, in the area, so that's a factor, as Luke mentioned. Um, he also tried to find, um, within the state, similar analysis like this, um, and he, he couldn't find anything, so he wasn't sure what would be expected. Um, so I think uh, he and Philip hoped to make this available, and then others could look at this and um, chime and say, yes, we're seeing similar changes or no, we're seeing something completely different. And, and of course, this is across many different sites. And of course, if you look in certain uh, at individual sites, even in our own watershed, you're going to see differences. Um, you know, the, some creeks will have uh, taxa that, that just don't even exist in other creeks at all, even though they're only miles apart. Um, so uh, in some cases, you, you do have to get down to the creek level to, um, to take a look at that, but this was a, a pretty easy way just to kind of summarize the data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, it looks like we have a few questions that came up in the chat, but you can also put them in the Q&A. It's a little bit easier for us to find them there for future questions. Um, Trish is asking, what do these changes indicate in this watershed? Um, you know, uh, for the most part, um, if you look at the, uh, the water quality index, which is the computed score, um, those bounce around a fair amount, but overall, uh, they've remained pretty steady. Um, you know, some of these certain tax will drop out like SCUD, and, but they'll be replaced by others like Odinates. Um, so, um, it kind of evens out in a way in terms of the overall water quality index, which is what Adopt a Stream looks at. Um, yeah. So overall, you know, in terms of how we how the creeks are rated, those that are poor have tended to stay poor. Those that are fair tend to stay fair, and those that are good tend to stay good. Um, and a lot of that, of course, has to do with land use around those particular creeks. Um, so, so the end of it, the, that scoring seems to be pretty stable, but there is a little bit of variance in what tax we're finding over the years. Jackie, could you scroll to where the water quality index scores are? Was it in the table? Yeah, it's in the table up above. Okay. And we can kind of see how those vary, but remain steady as you're describing, Ken. Let's see if I can get, I don't know if I can get it all in one window oh that's okay it looks like yeah. it looks like the water quality index is that second row 
Yeah. So you could focus on the upper half of the table. It's probably there, I see it now. Mm -hmm. And that, that ties in, of course, with the richness, which is the number of tax are found on average. And this table also highlights some things I mentioned before about differences between creeks, even in um, the upper county watershed. Um, certain creeks, if you scroll down, for instance, the Orange Trail Creek, oh, no, it's right there, the Orange Trail Creek, always, we always find gill snails there, mm -hmm. always, which is pretty amazing, but we rarely find them anywhere else in the area. Wow, um, yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, and of course, that, that creek has had its own issues at times um, for variety, well, for one main reason, which was a, a hog farm on the University of Georgia that used to overflow nutrients into it. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, it still has good water quality, according to the adopted stream scoring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we ha have another question from Lori Forrester, who asked, do you think the changes had anything to do with drought conditions? And I, we um, were looking at the, um, the taxa changes over time when she asked that question. Yeah, um, Luke and Philip did some other analysis of um, some of the other data that UN has related to um, turbidity, conductivity, et cetera. Um, and try to take into account drought and waterfall, but it can be difficult. Um, the drought years weren't really considered here, but certainly that could be looked at. Um, I'm trying to, th I think Luke did look at it at one point, and I'm thinking that, and I'll have to go back and confirm this with them, I think they were possibly finding more um, macroinvertebrates during those that period, possibly because they were more concentrated. There's less water for them to, to live in. Interesting. Um, but I, I wish he was here because he would know. But I, I think that, I think he may have found that to be possibly the case, yeah. Interesting. All right, any other questions? Can you scroll to the left? What are those graphs? Yeah, those ones. Oh, that's broken out by creek. Yeah, this is uh, this is the biological score, which is we and the UN database is called biological score. It's just the adopted stream water quality index. So, mm -hmm. so this gives you a, an idea of how it bounces around. Yeah. And if we looked at drought years, we could possibly. Well, I don't know. It is just so hard to. to all that out but mm -hmm. um, but anyway um, there's there's a fair amount of variance um, but uh, this does generally show the trend in certain and in, in, in some of the uh, creeks we have and, and in many cases the trend is somewhat down but it's been able to stay within the bounds of the fair good or, or sorry poor fair or good ratings. Is that, is that what that dotted line is? That goes the across? dotted line breaks, yeah. It's the, the lower bound is separates fair from, sorry, poor from fair, and then the upper line fair from good. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So they're bouncing around, generally trending a little lower, but staying within the bounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, quite a diversity in uh, creek quality too. Like the one in the upper left hand corner is has always been above good even when it's decreasing, whereas the one in the lower right seems to have pretty low quality. <laughs> yeah, Cart yeah, Creek has some issues with uh, having a former um, uh, uh, fertilizer plant right up against the creek and they still have nutrients being dumped into the creek all the time. So it has, it has some pretty serious issues. Um, we have another question from Trish, and she asked, how is the mean water quality value calculated? The, uh, the water quality index is um, you know, scored based on the adoptive stream, adoptive, adoptive stream protocol. And uh, that's calculated for each sampling uh, instance. And uh, that's recorded. And then the mean, which was in the table we just looked at, is just the mean value across uh, all the sampling instances that we had. Okay. 
Um, all right. Well, if anyone has any further questions, you can ask now. But if, if not, then I think that we'll transition to our, our next presenter. Um, yeah. So, Luke, I'm just going to, oh, we already did. <laughs> okay, so our second presentation um, is from Dr. Jonathan Davis and undergraduate students Elizabeth Howell and Mallory Down. So Dr. Davis is an associate professor of biology and environmental science at Young Harris College and specializes in aquatic ecology. Um, Elizabeth Howell and Mallory Downs are seniors that are majoring in environmental science and today they're going to be telling us about their research on volunteerism, science, and community engagement as it relates to water quality protection. And they recently completed this research as part of the Appalachian Teaching Project through the Appalachian Regional Commission. And last December, they presented this research to um, ARC leaders in Washington, D.C. Um, so this presentation is also going to be pre-recorded, and Jackie will be pulling it up moment. Hello, my name is Dr. Jonathan Davis. I'm an Associate Professor of Biology and Environmental Science at Young Harris College. I am joined by two undergraduate environmental science majors at the college, Elizabeth Howe and Mallory Downs. Our project is entitled Connecting Volunteerism, Science, and Community Engagement to Protect Water Quality in a Southern Appalachian Watershed. Partners on this project included a local nonprofit water quality organization, Mountain True, the Young Harris College Outdoor Leadership Program, and the Appalachian Regional Commission. This project was developed as part of the Appalachian Teaching Project. First, you're gonna hear from Elizabeth Howe, who introduces the project and talks about some of the community outreach activities that this project conducted. And then you'll hear from me again, as I provide uh, comments and notes that were written and composed by uh, Ms. Mallory Downs. I hope you enjoy our project. When a community is conscious of their local water quality and engaged in protecting it, the benefits can be seen in a healthy and productive ecosystem, increased economic opportunity, and an enhanced cultural identity of the region boasting pristine natural habitats. Good water quality starts with community involvement and consciousness that leads to citizens being able to contribute to the protection of their local waterways by volunteering as citizen scientists, where the data they collect helps form an overall picture of the health of a watershed. So the overarching goal of this project was to connect people with their local waterways and water quality through community engagement, and then illustrate scientifically the importance of citizen volunteer data in the process of water quality analysis. For the community engagement side of the project conducted by the senior outdoor leadership class, local residents were invited to Young Harris College campus on multiple occasions for a community work day to clear invasive plant species from the bank of Corn Creek, which runs directly through campus, and a Hidden Rivers Day, where guests were able to engage in activities such as viewing native minnow species in the plunge pool of a nearby waterfall, learning how to cast a fly rod, attending a community panel on water quality, and even viewing the film Hidden Rivers, which showcases the beautiful hidden world of life in the waterways of Southern Appalachia. Following the community engagement, the environmental methods class aimed to illustrate the importance of citizen scientists to the protection of water quality by using volunteer collected water quality data. First, as a class, we took on the role of citizen scientists and participated in a water quality workshop where Callie Moore, a representative from Georgia Adopt a Stream and nonprofit water quality management association, Mountain True, came and instructed our class on how to properly take water quality measurements. Through this, we learn that all volunteers are certified and participate in an annual training and that collection methods are standardized across all sampling sites to ensure the reliability of the data. To showcase the scientific utility of this volunteer data, we used it to determine the effect of land use on water quality in the Hiawassee River Basin. In order to achieve this, we took volunteer collected water quality data from 41 sites over five watersheds in the Hiawassee River Basin from the Georgia adopt stream website, which included our desired water quality parameters, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, pH, and E. coli count. 
we were then able to take the coordinates of the volunteer sample site and enter them into the United States Geological Survey Stream Stats database and delineate the basin upstream to identify land use statistics of that area of which we were primarily interested in the percent of agricultural area, percent of forested area, percent of developed area, and percent impervious surface. We compiled a large data set which included each sample site, the desired water quality parameters, and the desired land use parameters. And from there, we were able to conduct a variety of statistical tests, including correlation tests, ANOVAs, and principal components analyses in order to determine the effective land use on water quality. I will now be presenting the remainder of the project, the results, which was written and composed by Mallory Downs, but I'm providing uh, the recording due to um, audio issues. The results of the analysis of water quality data revealed that there was a significant difference in water quality among watersheds. These findings include a significant variation in dissolved oxygen among the lower Nautilus watershed and the upper Hiawassee watershed, and a significant variation in conductivity levels amount among Brasstown Creek and the upper Nautilus watershed. There was no significant differences in pH levels across sites. Correlation analyses were conducted and found significant relationships between upstream land use and water quality. Dissolved oxygen was directly correlated to forested area and conductivity was also correlated to forested, developed, and impervious area. For instance, the more forested area present, the lower the conductivity level is and the higher the dissolved oxygen. pH was not significantly correlated to any land use variables. When accounting for differences among sites and watersheds, the amount of impervious area and developed area significantly impacted dissolved oxygen, conductivity, and pH, respectively. However, the relationship sometimes varied among watersheds. As percent impervious area increased, so did conductivity. This causes impaired water quality due to the amount of dissolved solids entering waterways from asphalt and gravel. Species within these freshwater streams and rivers are adapted to a specific level of conductivity. So a sudden increase in these levels can disrupt aquatic ecosystem health. Our final figure is a principal components analysis that illustrates the water quality of sample watersheds. This figure is located at the very bottom of the poster towards the center. Sites that plotted out towards the top right of the figure are considered to have favorable water quality, while sites at the bottom left have poor water quality. Therefore, this figure can be used to set goals for restoration. Finding these findings, from these findings, we were able to identify sites and watersheds with poor water quality and determine impactful land use variables. This made it possible for us to develop recommendations to partners, stakeholders, and policymakers. We can continue this project by monitoring restoration and tracking water quality over time with the acquisition of future grants and funding. In conclusion, Appalachia consists of complex communities with many stakeholders addressing common challenges that can affect economic opportunity and natural and cultural assets of the area. Our project engaged the community to focus on a common resource and regional issue, leading to valuable findings that will promote the protection of the waters of Southern Appalachia and the biodiversity that swims in it. On behalf of Elizabeth Howe and Mallory Downs, thank you. Awesome, that was wonderful. Thank you for that um, really nice pre-recorded presentation. I think, did uh, Mallory, is it Mallory who was having trouble getting in, Dr. Dieser? Yeah, she's, she's on as an atten attendee. Oh, she's on. Okay, well, let's see if we can kind of bump her up real quick. Let's see, promote her to panelists. So hopefully she can come back in and 
um, be a part of this Q&A session. So if you haven't already, please um, put your questions in the Q&A. I see Vicki has already put one in. Um, so if you have any more for that presentation, please throw it in there. Hi, Mallory. Yeah, in. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. Awesome. Good to see you. Um, okay, well, you have one question so far um, from Vicki, and she's asking, what was the average age of community members participating in the outreach activity? Um, for the outreach activity, we had the students, we had outdoor leadership students who were like our age, and they would go out and they talk to people. And then we also had the um, citizen scientists, and those were more of like professors and everything. Um, I was kind of surprised that like it happened to be people who were older, but they still found time to engage and, you know, learn how to monitor water quality and everything. But yeah, so we had younger people and a little bit older people, and they all came together to be able to find this data and then go out and have outreach for the community. So it was a good combination of everyone. That's awesome. Um, I had a question. So if I was hearing the presentation right, you said that there was a a correlation when forest cover increased, conductivity decreased. Was that correct? Yes. And then there was also a correlation when percent impervious surface increased, conductivity increased. Yes, exactly. So um, as you have forested area increase, that means you're going to have more soils and trees and everything like that, but that's healthy for water. And um, but as you have impervious area, which that literally means like you have cement, asphalt, gravel, all those kind of substances. And then as that increases, you're gonna have more um, electrical current throughout the water. So that causes conductivity to increase. But like I said, as you have more forested area, conductivity decreases and is more of a healthy level because that's what the streams used to. Awesome. Um, do we have any other questions from our audience? If you do, put them in the Q&A. I was wondering um, also what variables you guys included in the PCA? Um, I'll take that one. Uh, so I guess first for anybody that's here that doesn't really um, understand PCA or principal components analysis, uh, essentially it's a method to take a large data set with many variables that are correlated and basically distill those correlated variables to two components or or you can think of it as variables that explain the most variation in the data so um, uh, when you look at those those the pca it, it's really saying a lot uh, but the variables that were strongest in terms of explaining uh the the variation are um, what's shown on the poster uh and it's uh, conductivity dissolved oxygen um, impervious surface and developed area but each one of those components uh, uh, include all the variables that were recorded. <laughs> so all the land use variables, and, and I, I think there was maybe 15 to 20 variables that went into that. Thank you for the explanation. Jackie, do you have any questions? I did. Um, I was just wondering, because it seems like you guys, you do so many different types of outreach events. Um, so, I mean, this is just a very light question, but, you know, do, is there a particular event that you think is like the most popular um, that you find like the most participation in? Um, it really depended on what event it was, because like when we had our community event where we had people come cut invasive species away from the riverbank, we had really, really good attendance for that. And that was more of a really involved outreach. So a different kind of people showed up to that that wanted to be involved and do that community service. And then we had more fun outreach, which we saw a lot of like younger and older community members that wanted to go have fun. Like we did tree climbing and fly fishing, uh, casting lessons. And then we had snorkeling in a plunge pool. Uh, so a lot of people enjoyed everything that they did. It just depended on if the person wanted to be more volunteer oriented or more like experiential fun oriented. Yeah, we specifically uh, organized an entire day of events so that we could accommodate people in their different schedules. Uh, and so people that really wanted to be active, they could come to the creek and do like tree climbing, uh, which was kind of designed with the idea that, you know, uh, to talk about the riparian zone. And so climb a tree next to a river and then get an understanding of kind of a 
the point of view of the tree as it shades the water and, and things like that. Uh, but then we show the movie Hidden Rivers later in the evening. And I think we had somewhere around 100 attendees, many of them students from the college, but uh, professors and their kids and, and um, some older community members. So we wanted to just make sure we had a, we had events that reached out to all different groups. And I'll, I'll just add that those events um, were, there was heavily, heavily promoted and influenced by a separate class, the um, an outdoor leadership class. So it's a group of students that, you know, their entire program is designed around, around engaging people in the outdoors and finding meaning in that. And so those students um, helped organize all those events. Oh, great. Thanks. Yeah, um, we have another question. I think you kind of answered it, but there could be a little more to add. Um, Vicki asked, how did you publicize your outreach opportunities to local citizens? Yeah, so we, as students in the classes, we promoted it to basically everyone we knew. There were posters put all up around campus and all around our community. Uh, I believe that we even had some Facebook posts about it. And we got people as far as UGA. We went to UGA and some of those students came to help out with us as well. Yeah, we promoted it through Mountain True, which was our partner on the project. So um, they, they basically uh, are tasked with uh, um, their passion is water quality within the watershed. And so they're responsible for training the volunteers that um, are certified for Georgia adopt stream So we definitely uh, uh, communicated with them to get some of those volunteers uh, to the events. And then we had the uh, pleasure of uh, going on the radio and uh, uh, talk, talking and, and publicizing uh, in that way as well. That's awesome that you guys are highlighted on the radio. <laughs> um, yeah, and I had one final question and audience members, please, if you have any more questions, just put them in the Q&A. Um, mine was that I really liked how you all ended the presentation saying like the results specifically of the PCA would be really good to identify um, streams and areas that are that need habitat restoration or could use habitat restoration. So I was wondering if there were any plans to actually act on that and and um, communicate those results to stakeholders who could who could provide that kind of work. Okay, okay. so uh, yeah, so we actually composed an entire report of this and that was sent to Mountain True. And so Mountain True has a whole list of the impaired areas, the good areas, areas that need checked up on and they are, uh, have that and they're going to go out and identify the cause as to why those areas are the way they are whether it's like leaking septic, septic systems or the areas too close to an agricultural area where they're getting too many nutrients or the cattle are too close to the riverside anything like that so mountain true has those resources now and they are now out identifying causes and working towards solutions yeah. we, we kind of hope that it will help help them in identifying maybe sites that or, or where to establish new sites within the watershed uh, and so you know pro help with them prioritizing uh, where they want to put new volunteers and establish new sites but um, this report also gives them a lot of data and information that will be useful for them if they are interested in applying for future grants or funding as well they would they would have that that report to um, support whatever project they're they're applying for. Yeah, that's such an awesome way to kind of complete the the science cycle. You know, I mm -hmm. it's really wonderful that you your project was able to do that. Well, awesome. Are there any more questions from the audience, or Beth, do you have any more questions? Does not seem like it. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Davis, Mallory, and Elizabeth. Dr. Davis, Mallory, and Elizabeth. Um, we're going to go to the last presentation. Um, which is from Tima, and she will be presenting live, and Jackie's going to pull up her presentation here in just a minute. Um, but Tima Hoskins is of South Paulding High School. Again, she's joining us live to share her students' work on E. coli and dissolved oxygen in their school's swamp. So thank you, Tima, um, and Jackie will play your presentation up now. Yes, thank you, Jackie, for doing this for me. Of course. <laughs> Let me get my mic on and Adobe up. Okay. Do, do, do.
Okay. So, thank you very much. Um, we are back in session here at school and still uh, dealing with a lot of technical difficulties. So um, I'm going to do the best I can here to not cut out. But at South Pauling High School, uh, we have a natural wetland that occurs behind the school. And so we get to perform um, research and collect data on that. The students affectionately call it Spartan Swamp. Um, and uh, some of them have created a social media type of uh, posting for, for everyone to, to see. <laughs> and I'm going to present my students' uh, projects today um, and what they did last year before we got called out of school. So, um, all right, next slide. Jackie, can you turn to the next slide, please? Oh, there we go. So um, the first thing that the students do is they kind of map out where the uh, location of the wetland is. And what you're seeing on the left hand side there is a visual from a hunting app. So they use a couple of different things, um, sometimes drones. Um, Excuse me, Tina. I think that there's a bit of a lag since you're on the iPhone. So Jackie, I think she's actually on the previous slide. But let's see here. I was, let's see if it will catch up. All right, that's good. Okay. I can see it. Um, so they, they measure the, the property to figure out how large the wetland is and they come up with different sample sites. And right behind the high school um, is also attached to an elementary school and is a really, really large leach field back there, um, right before you actually get to the wetlands. So we had our superintendent out last year and he made a comment like, well, I wonder if, you know, how effective is that um, field, you know, because there a way to determine how effective that field might be and, or how, how well it's working um, in terms of, you know, affecting your wetland. So that's where the E. coli um, study had come in for, for the students. Uh, and also to, to point that out, um, right behind the school is a, an environmental, um, it's, a, it's an issue in our community where they're trying to um, put in a quarry um, back there off of um, the mountains. It's about 1.9 miles behind the school. So the students in this bottom picture are just trying to show you how far away the, the actual, um, the environmental site was that was a second part of the research. But okay, next slide. <laughs> These are a few photos of the students. Uh, everyone that you're seeing in these photos, they are all off to college and onto great things. But I actually asked that they take pictures of their uh, data, their E. coli, their, their slides or anything that they do. Um, and we use a lot of probeware, as you will see in the data charts coming up, but I still go through the actual uh, titration process with them and allow them to do it um, either way. But what you're looking at out front in the wetland is just our main um, site where we enter the wetland at and actually collect our samples um, that way. And then down in the bottom, they actually did a comparative analysis with, the, um, with a local golf course. And so you see students directing where to sample at that golf course too. Okay, next slide. So this is our data from 2019. We have data that goes all the way back to 2018 and, uh, and forward. And so the students collect the water chemistry data um, by Adopt-A-Stream. Um, we do have a few more pieces of equipment where they uh, will do like light saturation and collect um, <clears throat> turbidity through two different types of instruments. But part of their overall learning process is to get them to collect data, create a spreadsheet, learn how to organize it. And then once they can get a couple of uh, samples, then they run graphs so that they can talk about it and compare. In this particular year, we did three different sites. Uh, students call them um, the pool, which is a large pooling area right next to the actual uh, field. And then there's a marshy area where the wetland is actually a little thicker um, and they'll do sampling in there and then of course um, out into out into a more open area uh, 
next to actually what is now <laughs> has lots of beaver dams <laughs> lined up along the side. Um, so they try to pick a couple of different areas. It gives them more to talk about, you know, how things affect. And it also allows us to see like how the, the field there is working compared to um, a good 300 yards or so away from the actual field. Okay, next slide. So this is their, uh, their question and how they were going to ask a question and then we're going to talk about uh, fecal coliform bacteria and, and, you know, and, and their analysis um, and their very uh, short procedure that was put on there that was on their poster uh, which just follows the adopt a stream procedures for sampling from the bacteria. All right next slide. And so this is their data that they collected. You can see that this goes up to the end of that time period. Uh, they did do three different times and they did three different locations. And I find it interesting that when you actually look at the data, um, you can see that based on the time of day that they collected it, they actually got some different uh, amount of colonies there. When they performed this analysis in 2019, then in February 20th of 2020 this year, they wanted to compare it to a golf course to see if it was working similar um, or if, you know, what could they say? How, how does a golf course deal with a, a similar issue? And so below it on that very large um, data table uh, is the, our normal location sites. And then above it, you will see the uh, golf course. And so they did four samples. They, all, they did all of this in the same day, uh, uh, four different sample sites on our actual wetland and four different sample sites on the golf course. Uh, they ran everything from uh, you know, temperature to pH to dissolved oxygen. We did uh, SECI depth readings on all of those locations and we did um, E. coli trials on um, sampling on all of those locations as well. So they collected a huge data set that day uh, and didn't get a chance to graph a lot of this because it was just a few short weeks after where um, school was called out, but they did get enough data to, to compare. Okay, next slide. These are photos of um, their, their plates just for quality control and um, teacher, teacher assurance more so. I ask that they, we have a light box where they can um, put their plates on and take photos and catalog them in photos as well. It also helps the next group of stu students learn how to, learn how to uh, do it. Like what are they actually looking for? And it also allows me to kind of keep a record and verify everything that they've done. Basically, when it came down to the E. coli, which they actually finished, they did say that based on our collection process that um, our wetland is healthy for a wetland. It's uh, safe to swim in moderately, um, but you know, you wouldn't recommend swimming in a wetland for uh, recreational reasons. reasons. Uh, but we did also notice, if you look in these pictures in particular, that the pool area, which is all the way, um, which is the first the first column, you can see that there's significantly more colonies that formed in that pool area versus the, um, the extended part of the actual wetland. And uh, one of the photos before was another teacher, she's their AP stats teacher, and she ran, um, the students ran a statistical analysis or a hypothesis test, which is not in the presentation. Uh, but as it turns out, it is significantly different. So the location that's right next to the field um, even though the colonies are still low in number statistically, um, it is different than the other areas of the actual wetland. So our, um, our wetland is doing its job. Next slide, please. Another project that we had submitted was uh, chlorophyll. Um, we didn't get a chance to finish this and the first collection was in February, uh, so it was winter. But overall, the idea was is that the students wanted to see if um, the, they wanted to indirectly measure phytoplankton um, biomass and uh, have that 
kind of correlate to primary productivity. So they started with measuring the concentration of chlorophyll A. They began a procedure uh, and we have a, a small uh, spec machine that they can actually put their samples in after their after their procedure and it will it will run probably 30 minutes or longer <laughs> uh, each of the samples so the first graphs I, I know that they're really challenging to see but the first uh, part of it is just the running the actual actual natural sample samples and then they um, ran a corrected sample to make the lines kind of fall uh, a little bit more equally. And you can see that based on the rough samples and then on the um, corrected samples that the, the blank is on the, is on the bottom. And then you can see the chlorophyll on top. They got a chlorophyll reading even in, in winter for every single location site. Uh, and they were all really, really close. And so when we ran a hypothesis test on those, there's really no significantly there's no significant difference in any area of the wetland um, and its pro productivity. So it's similarly productive everywhere. Next slide, please. Part of um, our process is also to go to our community um, and get involved. This is a local town hall meeting where um, where I mentioned before the quarry, which is less than two miles away from the high school. It is in another county, but this, uh, this, this town hall meeting was held and the students were invited to essentially educate the community about um, water quality and how to measure water quality and explain to them, you know, what it is that they do and how we track our wetland. And it was a really, <laughs> it was a really good turnout because even though the citizens were there to um, discuss the, the legal um, the legal problems with putting in this this quarry down the street here. Um, the students were able to at least educate them on all of these different ways that we can uh, measure and and get involved with what is you know with what is our natural system there. Uh, we learned a lot about that area. It's in um, it's a it's a natural uh, it's a natural site. Um, it's mostly basalt exposed basalt and there's a lot of special things about the area that they want to put a quarry in um, and all of those legalities pick up here in a couple more months they've been postponed because of COVID but we um we do go out to the community and show them the process uh, there's the pictures of them okay next slide please so Part of the probeware equipment that we have does live cell data. Um, when we're out into the wetland, we can put the probeware in the water and it will upload a active, immediate uh, data table and chart to our cell phones and we can send it into another class. So our math classes, this one in particular is AP stats, but all of our stats classes um, are receiving every morning a uh, a chart um, or an Excel sheet from our probeware so they can use those that data as warm-ups. It's one more way to integrate water quality and stewardship into all other classrooms in the high school. Uh, this is something the students really love because even if they never, you know, make it to <laughs> uh, AP classes, which are only offered, you know, their senior year, um, having this data spread throughout the entire school allows all the students in our high school to see what we're doing um, and also it makes it more meaningful right the data that they collect that day is relative to what's on property um, they connect better with it and the math teachers have really enjoyed it because that aspect has you know really interested students next slide might be I think that is the end of it. Yep. I am. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to share or to talk about? Um, no, um, not, not right this second. You know, we're, uh, we're, we're busy getting in the swing of things here um, at Paulding County Schools as the time has started where we've been back now for almost two weeks um, and the students are 
really, really excited to um, get in that wetland and uh, finish some of the data collection that the last year students actually didn't get a chance to finish. And actually, that's what they were doing today was going over um, all of their, the collection of the E. coli data and um, the chlorophyll data, because that was kind of almost, you know, captured in time. Um, and it would be nice to get a uh, spring, summer-ish uh, sample to, to also compare it. To. But, you know, that's, that's really it. Wow, well, thank you. That was a great, great presentation. That was a great <laughs> presentation. And <laughs> <Seltzer. laughs> thanks. Yeah, I think that it worked fine. Um, it was awesome. Oh, we do have a question, a follow-up question from Cecilia who asked, do you have any suggestions for high school teachers that are looking to start a program or projects like this with their students? Uh, so I recommend that um, you find your local Adopt-A-Stream <laughs> coordinator. Um, mine's online, I know he is. He's, he's wonderful to, to get you started on, on that. Um, I would always recommend starting with a smaller group and then Moving on to a larger group, um, that's where I feel like I went wrong. I started with 90 students. <laughs> um, and find a way to, to share that love so that it's, it becomes part of your overall school, you know, school culture. Uh, this will be year three for me now. And the students come in the room, they sit down, and they're like, we're ready to go. Like, we know what the expectation is. We know what we're doing. Um, and... The volunteer part also allows for lots of opportunity for the students to uh, look different on college applications. I mean, we have students with 4.0s that still get waitlisted, and you know, I never thought I'd, you know, I'd say that one day. It's becoming really competitive, and so stewardship and volunteerism really sets them apart. Um, my students will put their research projects um, and their outreach on their college application, and if they get waitlisted. Last year I had four kids where um, the committee reviewed it and they went ahead and UGA took them in. So um, it really does set them apart. That's awesome. Thank you for that, Tina. Um, oh, we have another question. Okay. Oh, all right. Vicki has some love to share and then a question at the end. She says, we need more teachers doing this type of inquiry learning in a real life situation that also serve the serves the community. Thank you and congratulations. Keep it up. You make a real difference in our world. Thank you so, so much. That's awesome. I second that, Vicki. You're, what you're doing is wonderful. And then her question is, would you have lesson plans that could be shared with other AP teachers? <clears throat> I have assignments <laughs> and I do. I have lots of assignments. I have a um, EPBL. So EPBL is project-based learning with our environmental twist on it. I teach chemistry, um, physics, some biology classes, and earth science. Like, <laughs> so I take that EPBL and I integrate it into all of those classes so that everyone gets the experience, even like 10th grade chemistry. Um, and so I have it in multiple subjects I should I can definitely um, find a way to, to share that yeah so that you can see uh, like the physics version and maybe the chemistry version and then we all know that we can connect the environmental science version but um, getting physics out there to measure the heights of the trees you know that's <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's fun though too right yeah um, maybe you could if you wanted to share your email address or something she could get in contact with you potentially but we can yeah. arrange that later. <laughs> I think that was Vicki who asked that. So um, you can, Vicki, you can email us and then we can hook you up with Tima if you're interested in getting those resources. Um, we do have, I know that it's one o'clock. So if any of you need to hop off and go, we totally value your time. And so please feel free to do so. But if you do have a few minutes and can stay on, we really appreciate that. Um, Mallory Downs has a question for you, Tima, which is why would E. coli levels be higher in a pool area rather than another location? So it was the um, it was the location next to the the leach field. If, um, there's the school, and then there's an elementary school, and then there's a mode field. It's 
would have been easier uh, to see it like on the um, on the slide, but a mode field where both of the actual you know schools are their uh, septic system runs into, and so the pool area is directly adjacent to that that field, and the students measured that, and then they walk more towards Sweetwater Creek, which, which was in the map, um, and then north towards the road the roadway. Now, so interesting enough, there's beavers towards the roadway, right? Um, and then the Sweetwater Creek area is a little faster moving water. Um, so they took samples outside of that, uh, us, uh, outside of that whole general area on more than what you see actually in the data table. But we think that maybe it has something to do with um, the septic system right there. You know, um, so our superintendent is the one that asked that question while he was out visiting with us one day in the wetland. And so um, we reported it to him, but it does show that it's doing its, because once you get so far, uh, the whole wetland process kicks in and then we see really swimmable water uh, just outside of that. So. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, you know, but that's really cool too how, you, you know, they're able to like walk the whole area and kind of see the transitions and like, yes, the wetland process like occurring to, you know, clean up the water and they can see the different locations and the impacts that it would have on the quality. That's really, that's cool. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. Um, well, I just wanted to, if the other presenters want to turn on their videos again, just so the attendees can see you and we can just, I don't know, if we were in person, we would all give one more big round of applause to everyone who presented. So Jackie and I can just, <laughs> can just give you applause. <laughs> so thank you everyone for being here today um, and presenting and staying on to ask questions and kind of um, being flexible and understanding as the conditions right now are kind of strange. So we really appreciate your flexibility. And also it was really cool to see that many of the research projects you presented involved local partners and not only did they involve local partners, but you communicated your results to the broader community and those results are being used for, for better management and more monitoring. So that's really awesome to see. So great job. Um, so that does conclude our poster session. We do have just a few closing remarks and reminders. So again, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is part one of two poster sessions. So if you enjoyed what you um, learned and heard and want to join for part two, that's next week from 5 to 6 p.m. next Friday. Um, and those topics are going to include the impacts of climate change on stream temperature, a comparison of benthic invertebrates in the Etowah River, and also water contamination in the Atlanta area. Um, and then to register for that, you would just go to our registration page. Um, Jackie is going to be posting all of these links in the chat. Um, there are also non-research poster or not non-research other sessions. So next week, there's also a coastal topic session on Wednesday um, and lots of other sessions coming up. So please check the schedule and register for the ones you're interested in if you like. And then if one is at a time that you can attend, that's all right because we're recording them all and you can find all of those recordings on our resources and recordings page. Yes, and we also have, all right, all the, all the links are posted down in the chat. Um, so we also have our silent auction going on for the month of August. Um, we have a few bids going in, so um, there's lots of items up for um, bidding right now. We have tickets to the aquarium, to the zoo, winery packages, a whole assortment of things. So if you haven't already, uh, you can follow the link in the chat to place, um, to look at the items and place your bids. Um, also, uh, if you have any questions about Adopt-A-Stream or would like to, you know, connect or, you know, with some of the presenters or have, you know, additional questions for them, you can always email us. The, our email is in the chat and then we can connect you with the presenters. I also went ahead and added the link to the water science poster page that's on our website. So everyone's um, Posters and PowerPoints will be uploaded there so that way you can view them um, at your own time and um, you know see all the graphs and visuals a little clearer. 
And at the end of this webinar, you will be directed to a session survey, just a brief five question survey. If you have the time, we'd appreciate your feedback on how we can make our sessions better. And yeah, that's, that's all I have. So uh, thank you everyone again for joining us. Um, we, you know, we hope you join us again for part two next week and have a great day. Thank you to our presenters. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.